Okay, hello everybody and welcome to our next edition of the SSMF at Home series. Uh, we're doing this summer uh, in place, in, partially in place of our uh, canceled summer music festival at Swanee. Uh, my name is John Kilkenny and I'm very happy to have uh, a dear friend who I'm going to tell you all about in just a second uh, on our first of what will be several conductor conversations uh, that we're having this summer. But first, I just wanted to let everyone who's watching know a little bit about what is happening besides the stream. So we, in addition to um, the SSMF at Home series we have, we have uh, just about 100 students taking classes online with us this summer, doing uh, private lessons, uh, composition class, various other things across our whole uh, program, which is terrific. Really happy to have all of those students with us. We have this series and we're really excited about a call for scores that we put together. So we have an international uh, composition competition that was announced in um, earlier in the spring. Uh, the deadline's coming up, it's, the deadline is in August and we'll be featuring the winners of the uh, competition next summer in Swanee uh, as part of our 2021 season. And uh, really happy about that. We have about 40, 45 applicants so far that have sent scores for chamber pieces and orchestra works and look forward to sifting through those with our, our faculty soon. So. Uh, anyway, just wanted to kind of tell everyone what we're up to and uh, really happy to have a, a, an old and dear friend. Well, he's not old, but we've known each other a long time. A, a dear friend, uh, Giacomo Barros. Yeah, and uh, we, we've known each other, I think, probably since, at least for me, from almost the beginning of, the, of my professional, pre-professional life, even but going back to Aspen. We were students there and we did our undergrad together. And so uh, very happy to have you with us, Giacomo. Nice to, nice to be here. Thanks, man. Glad to be here. Glad to be a part of this. I love Swanee so much. I've been there a few times, as you know, of course, and uh, really, really glad to, to take part in this today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, th there's so many ways we can go with this discussion. We, we already talked for a little while before this and, it, you know, I wish we could have aired some of that, but that'll that'll stay yeah. off forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but I just wanted to, to kind of tee up a, a bit of an easy place to start here is you know, every I'm always fascinated by people's career evolutions. You know, both of us um, went to the schools where we went, and you were at Interlock and before Juilliard, and and uh, you know, on in, in your training um, to do very different things than what we're doing now, right? Like we're both we both have very different careers. If we could go back in time to talk to our you know 20 year old selves and say, hey, guess what you're going to be doing when you know 20 or so years from now. Uh, we would be shocked. So, so can you talk a little bit about your evolution from an orchestral player and, you know, where you were working at, at that point in your life and kind of what brought you to the podium and, uh, you know, what kind of inspired you to take that direction? All right. Set the timer because this I'm just saying, yeah. And, and if, you, if, you know, <laughs> if we have some signals to set up here to make sure that we, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have our, we have our little private signals. So, well, again, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to, talk to you, to the students and to anyone who's listening about, you know, a role in a, a, a musical life, uh, uh, having a career. And basically a, a good friend of mine um, had defined a career as basically paying your bills by doing what you love. <laughs> and I love that. I love that description of it. So yes, went to Juilliard, was Mr. Gung Ho, tuba player, wanted to be in an orchestra, wanted to play in the New York Philharmonic, the Chicago Symphony, which I got to do in both orchestras. But I, my goal was to obviously have my own position in an orchestra. And when I bounced around to a couple of orchestras, I was overseas for a while. Um, I took a bunch of auditions in the States. It's funny, when I was up and coming as a young tubist, like in my early 20s, mid-20s, that's when all the tuba auditions were happening across the country. The National Symphony, Boston Symphony, Seattle Symphony. I mean, the list went on and on. It was like, wow, well, I'm going to get a job. It's going to be great. You know, there's so many wonderful, that's what I'm here to do. And I felt very confident and, you know, thinking that I was going to have that as my career. Well, lo and behold... Winning a job in a big orchestra is difficult. And uh, to be honest, really? I did not. Yeah, it's pretty hard. I did not get very far in U.S. auditions. I mean, I got out of the first round of a couple, but for whatever reason, I was always striking in Europe. And I never could really put my finger on it until later in life, which was in Europe, you have to play usually a solo first, or some sort of like solo piece of music. Sometimes it's with piano, sometimes it's without piano, but that's the way they want to hear you first. So the, every job I did well in, like a couple jobs in Spain, I got pretty far in the Concertgebouw Orchestra, which was my dream orchestra, uh, all started with solos. Whereas in the States, it's like execute the excerpt perfectly for a couple bars and they'll let you do another one until they decide either you're going to go to the next round or not. I just wasn't, it just didn't, I wasn't doing well with that. However, um, playing in an orchestra and playing in different orchestras from everywhere, from the New York from my Chicago Symphony to smaller orchestras in Spain, there was something I noticed in everyone that I felt like, 
I, I, it was a little rub inside of me that I couldn't, I couldn't wash away. Now I had always been fascinated by conductors from when I was a kid, when I was at Interlock and I used to play in the world youth symphony orchestra and I'd see like Larry Ratcliffe and actually Joanne Folletta, who I admire tremendously. And, and just, you know, uh, just wonderful conductors would come through there. Wonderful orchestras. It was so inspiring. I just like, this is what I wanted to do. And I always was fascinated by the conductor. And same at Juilliard. I got to play with Kurt Mazur and Pierre Boulez and all these amazing people. And something about the relationship between an, a conductor and the musicians of an orchestra, some sort of that magical, you know, non-communicative or at least verbally connection that happens. I just was always very interested in that. It was something I couldn't like. It wasn't black and white. I could never figure it out. And I couldn't figure out why a musician would resonate with this conductor or an orchestra would resonate with this conductor or not. I just couldn't figure it out. And it was always fascinating to me. But the rub I felt as I played a career all over, you know, Europe and then back in, in the into the Asia where my final position was at the Singapore Symphony, I just felt like my talents as a human being weren't being maximized. And I couldn't put my finger on it exactly, but I just felt like sitting in the back of the orchestra as a tuba player, getting to play wonderful rep, getting to watch the orchestra breathe and move in a way, it just wasn't over time I found it to be not something that was giving me the kind of juices to have this energetic feeling of life within. I just well, knew that there was something more to that. Well, and there's something interesting about like, you know, as a tuba player or former tuba player as a percussionist, you know, we spend a lot of our time sitting right in the orchestra and sort of counting rests and watching things. And, and, you know, in my own, and this conversation is with you, not with me, but in my own experience doing things outside of playing percussion, a lot of times it's been because I've been sitting there in rehearsal and watching it and going like, gee, you know, what does the personnel manager do? And who's the contractor? And I'll look at the conductor. And I, you know, there's yeah. stuff that like, you know, if you're a violinist and you're playing a million notes in a concert, like you're just hanging on for dear life to try to get through the rehearsal. Uh, and, you know, we're sitting in the back watching and, and kind of taking it all in. And I think it, it does give a different perspective to what, um, to what happens in the, in the, in the orchestra. So, sorry. So yeah. you're a tuba player and you're oh. looking at things and trying to figure yeah. out like fitting your life right. mission into mm -hmm. what you're doing. Exactly. And I, I got really blessed in my late 20s. I started playing with the Cincinnati Symphony kind of regularly. And I basically was their de facto tuba player for about two seasons. And that's when I got to tour the world and make all these great recordings. And I was like, I felt like that was the epitome of where I belonged. Then I had an opportunity to play in the Singapore Symphony and it was a position I won and I loved it. And I decided, you know what, I want a job of my own. Cincinnati's great, but I'm a substitute. Who knows when that'll end? Next conductor comes in and doesn't like me, whatever. I just, as much as I love Cincinnati, I thought, let me go try this opportunity out in Asia. And when I got to Asia, that's when it really hit the fan of like, okay, I've taken like over 20 auditions, maybe 30 auditions. I had just taken the audition for the Royal Concert about got to like the final three. I'm sitting here in the Singapore Symphony. San Francisco Symphony popped up. It was my first year in Singapore. I was like, let me go take this. This is my dream work. I want to do it. Right. This is like exactly where I want to be. Ah, the recordings, all of it. <laughs> I spent like $2,500, like this is like 2005, six, to fly all the way to the U.S. From Singapore. Tubas, from Asia, from Singapore. <laughs> Practice was ready, like spent all my months. I got on stage, John. I played maybe two minutes, maybe like I played the first page of the volume of concerto and the Maestro singer. And they were like, thank you. I didn't even oh, pick up my seat tuba. Oh, and I was God. like, you know what? I think I'm done. I think this part of my life is done. I'm playing yeah. a great orchestra, world-class orchestra with Singapore, but like, you know what? I know the tuba players are winning these jobs. I personally don't feel like someone's a better musician or not. I mean, some people are great. Like, don't get me wrong. I respect everyone. It's just, uh, I didn't, I'm like, I don't understand the reasoning here. But the reasoning was, is I never mastered the execution of an audition in the way some people do. I just didn't. Right. My forte was musicianship, listening, chamber music, all that good stuff. Anyway, so in Singapore, I had found an opportunity to do a little more with the symphony because the general manager really believed in me. I had a lot of energy. I was like gung-ho to do things right in the symphony. It's hard to believe we had a lot of energy. I don't see it. it's really not coming <laughs> no. through to me at all. Yeah. I, no, no, no. It was like very, yeah. very, very little bit of the energy. Uh, I, I, I was offered an opportunity to run the Singapore Symphony Chamber uh, series, which was fun for me because I got to like host from the stage and talk and put programs together. The caveat was I had to get the musicians inspired to want to do it because it was a program that was kind of being forced on the musicians. Some didn't really want to do it. So I'd go and talk to them. So I had to build consensus. I had to build a consensus on who would play what and where and with who and music. So it was very like psychologically interesting and on top of that it was asia so it was like 
I was learning about people and skills and orchestral musicians and repertoire. I was conducting a little bit here and there because I just wanted to dip my toe in. I was trying to do it like silently so the conductor wouldn't find out. I'd do like maybe one piece on every other program. But the series went from like 200 people coming into our concerts to like 400, 500 people after just like half a season. And so after the first half season of me doing it, the symphony's like, all right, it's yours. Like, go ahead and take this series and do what you want with it. So then I started experimenting more, pushing the album more, trying out conducting. I started a little youth orchestra. And then one day I had this dream that I was conducting the Singapore Symphony. And I was like, ooh, that was interesting. And um, I put, you know, and I had been thinking about conducting, I had wanted to do it, and I thought I wanted to try it. Basically, at this point in my life, I wanted to try all the things that I felt like I was interested in. And if nothing stuck or nothing felt good or nothing felt right, I was happy to stay in the orchestra. However, I just knew at some point in time, I didn't want to live there the rest of my life. Not that I didn't love Singapore, it was a great place, but I knew I wanted to be back in the US at some point. And also, I just felt like I was not maximizing the talents I had within. So by trying all this different stuff, running this the chamber music series, starting a youth orchestra, putting concerts together, I wrote scripts for conductors. Um, I remember one time when Katrina happened in the U.S., the hurricane Katrina, uh, everyone around the world sent out an outpouring of support and prayers. And at the symphony, we did the same thing. We played just a qu closer walk with thee from the symphony brass quintet. And our conductor was Asian. He was from Singapore. He didn't really understand dynamics about what was going on. And I wrote him a little script and read to the audience. He read it to the audience. And then we played. And everyone was like, wow, that was the best the conductor ever spoke about. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I wrote that. So then I started to feel like I had a knack for the presentation of it and all that stuff. So long story short, um, I saw an opportunity in Singapore to put on a concert with the symphony and I presented it to the orchestra. It was a Latin pops program with an artist named Nestor Torres who came to Singapore a lot and performed at the Soka Kakai Institute and meditation centers and Buddhist centers. And he had a huge following there. So he already had a built in fan base. He had all these amazing charts. And I went to the orchestra and said, look, I know this guy. He wants to play. I can help find the money for it. I can conduct it. What would you think if we put on this Latin pops concert? And they're like, well, we don't know. I, uh, you know, let, you know, if you can find fifty thousand dollars, so we can like cover the expenses of the concert, then we'll let you do it. And they're like, eh, 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 he's never gonna find. He'll, he's never gonna, gonna find fifty thousand, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went right back to Soka Gakai, the 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 the, um, the religious organization that really loved Nestor and had him out. I said, hey, the Singapore Symphony wants to do this concert. <laughs> Nestor wants to come out and play. You know, I kind of like right. hoodwinked everybody in a very polite way. And sure, I said, sure, but sure. I need 50 grand to raise the concert. How would you guys feel about either sponsoring this concert or maybe sponsoring a set of tickets, blah, blah, blah. They're like, we'll buy it the whole first night at 50 grand. Can you do that? And I was like, wow. Took it back to the Singapore Symphony, like literally three days later. And they're like, oh, Giacomo, good to see you so again. How are you doing? Great. I got, uh -huh. I got the money. They're like, got the money for what? I was like, for the concert, you said fifty thousand dollars. We can do this concert. And they're like, uh, you found fifty thousand dollars, and they didn't believe me. So the GM and me, we went to the Soka Kakai people, and we actually met with them and talked with them, and they were they were serious. And he said, okay. So he presented to the board. They let me do a concert. It took a year to put together, and honestly, the feedback and reactions I got from the musicians of the orchestra led me to believe that I might have a chance to pursue this a little further. Now I hit a roadblock, and this is where. This is where the career comes into play. I was perfectly happy to stay in Singapore playing the tuba, maybe doing one or two pops concerts a year, running the chamber series, like doing all these things that were activating my creativity as well as building skill sets that I could take back to the States one day. However, the music director got wind of it and was like, no, I'm cutting this out. We're not going to do pops. We're not going to do Arthur Fiedler, even though I wasn't planning on doing Arthur Fiedler. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Well, he why just are you going after Arthur Fiedler like that? I mean, I it's What's wrong with Arthur Fiedler? Are there Arthur Fiedler, Fiedler right? Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, he just didn't want to have it. And so I had to swallow that bullet. So I tried to put some stuff on on the side. It just wasn't really hitting. And then finally I had an opportunity to go study with Gustav Meyer and Larry Ratcliffe at a festival in the Czech Republic. And that's where my life changed. And that's where Gustav Meyer and Larry said, hey, there's some talent in you. We don't know really what it's all about. But if you want to study conducting and be a conductor, we think you can make it. I called my mom. I said, Gustav Meyer thinks I can be a conductor. What do you think I should do? She's like, you got to do it. You only get these kinds of opportunities that pop up every once in a while. You got to go do it. So I made the shift. Left my job, left a very cushy teaching job, left a cushy performance job, and started all over again back at 30 years old, back at school. And that's like an incredibly, I don't know, scary isn't really the right word, but like I think a lot of, of people, regardless of the field they're in, or, or but certainly musicians, you know, we're faced with these, you know, if we're lucky enough, and I think about this in my own life with, with the, the jobs that I have and, and 
you know, when you're lucky enough to have a job that is secure and comfortable, you know, it, it can make it harder to take a risk, right? And and you factor in a little bit of age and you factor in a little bit of, you know, whatever experience, like it makes it more difficult um, to roll the dice and say, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. And so like the fact that you went, uh-oh, we have lost, potentially lost our guest. Ah, there he is. He's back. I was just saying really great stuff about you the whole time while we cut out there. Are you back with us? You, let me take you out here real fast. We will be right back. I wish I can tell jokes right now while we wait to get Giacomo back, but uh, I'm just going to see if we can get that Wi-Fi connection back with our guest. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the broadcast right now. And uh, when we can come back, um, we will. Ah, there he is. Okay. I gotta shut, I'm so sorry. I got to shut everything down because another call came in. Um, and All right. So we're getting our tech worked out, and I'll just use some soft shoe here and, and pad just for a second until we can get. Uh, I think we're good. All right. Hey, look at that. I got to tell jokes and, uh, you know, sorry about that. I, I've learned I have to turn off my phone. It's no, no problem. While, well, we, while we talk, my apologies. You know, as, as, as musicians, we're that's totally fine. And, you know, uh, improvisation, right. You know, this is what we do. So yeah. tell, tell a few stories and, and, you know, make it happen. And as, as a musician, you should never turn your phone off. So I said, <laughs> you're never going to, uh, Except when you're actually doing a live interview, but that's yeah, okay. it's all right. You know, it's okay. We'll edit it in post. It's fine. It's no worry about it. Uh, so, so we were talking about Singapore. We were talking about leaving uh, and making changes in careers. And I think this is something that you know, in retrospect, it looks like the most obvious thing in the world to do, right? Like, of course you right. should. Do this. Of course you should leave your comfortable job and go take take this huge risk to study and spend money and all this other stuff. But at the time, it's got to be frightening. And I think all of us have those moments when we make a decision to, uh, you know, if you want to take the island, you have to burn the boat, you know. And so, mm. you know, for, for, for you to, to leave, you know, a, a comfortable and, you know, excellent orchestra position. I mean, a full time job in an orchestra, particularly as a tuba player, when there's one of you in each orchestra, regardless of anything, is an extraordinary thing to accomplish. Right. So. So then to put that down and to move on. Um, so it, it's a huge thing to do. And I think for the students that are watching, I think for, for you know, all the people that, that are watching here as, as artists and as musicians, you know, we, we, we think about taking risks every day in our careers. I mean, our whole career is a risk. I mean, our whole career is currently shut down, right? So, I mean, we, we all understand the risk of, of this, but it's still something you have to do if it's what you passionately believe in. And this was clearly something that, that you felt yourself that you could be, you could serve your craft better and your art better and your life better by following this path rather than kind of staying where you were. So you go study with uh, Gustav Meyer. So you're a Peabody and, and that, that experience and, you know, briefly, if you want, just to kind of touch upon, you know, we, I know we lost uh, Mr. Meyer fairly recently. And so if you want to just kind of touch upon that experience of studying with him and having that opportunity, what he was like as a mentor, uh, I'm, Curious myself. I don't really care if anyone else is. I want to know what that was like <laughs> to work with him. For sure. Uh, no, he was incredible. For a minute, I mean, yeah. Definitely. I but I want to go back to something you said about uh sure. you know making the change because I think it is important for people to know that the in the 21st century, the jobs that are gonna be like available to human beings, in my personal opinion, are the creative ones, the creative entrepreneurs, the ones that are out doing art, doing poetry, putting concerts, presenting concerts uh creating experiences for others uh those are the ones that are going to be really the, the the high impact jobs that are going to be out there the creative like entertainment music all of it but i think for me personally it was impact at the end of the day i couldn't put my words together earlier about it but like i wanted to have a more impact not only in my own life but also in the lives of others and the people we serve as as musicians and i think I was hanging on to an old story for a long time of like, I must play an orchestra. I must get a job. I must do this. I had my teacher in my head. I had my mother in my head. I had my neighbor in my head. I had the trombone player 
three stands down in my head. I don't know this guy. I didn't grow up with this guy. What do you, you know? I need to make myself happy. And I think by, to me, it didn't seem like a risk at the time because I believed in me. And I always, always tell people invest in yourself and don't give up and you'll be fine. Like as long as you really, really want something, you'll get out of bed at 5 a.m. in the morning and do it. You know, Will Smith has a big thing that he talks about where he's like, you know, I want to lose weight or I want to be this or I want to do that. Well, if you're not getting up at five in the morning to do it and you can't get yourself to get up at five in the morning, to do it. You really don't want it that bad. You know, like, so what are we talking about here? Like we can talk about what we want, but the, the follow through and have a prompt to like kick in the motivation is, is important. So, you know, when, when you were telling that story about like all these things about changing, I thought to myself, don't hang on to the old stories. You're constantly creating your life in front of you every day. Every day you wake up and it's a day for you to create your best life. Your, your, you know, a friend of mine jokes about, I'm just trying to curate my best life. And I think it's funny, but the reality is it's true. You're every day just waking up trying to create your best life for yourself with an eye toward the future, of course. But at the same time, what is it that is, is your life moving forward? Not the old story that's holding you back. So that's that. Um, Meyer, yeah, I got very, very lucky with him because he saw my DVDs of the work I was doing and he, you know, he called me up and he had, we had this really wonderful call and I remember just feeling like what a warm individual, such a sensitive man. And just by his voice, I knew that this was someone I needed to go and spend time with. Now, I was raised by my grandmother, so I have a very special connection with older people. I don't know. It's always been like this. I've always felt like a real connection to people in their 70s and 80s and 90s. And in fact, one of my best friends in the world was in Amarillo. He was 104 when he passed and wow. he was 99 when I got the job, you know, so like I got to be with him his last five years of his life and just hang out with him and talk with him and be around him. And I mean, the guy was incredible. So anyway, Meyer had this like obviously just grounded he just knew what he, he had a keen eye and just by being around his soul was just so was so beautiful of course i learned so much about how to study a score the way to look at a score the way to prepare a score the way to prepare a rehearsal the way to you know you got you know moving the arms is like this much of conducting some of it's psychology and study and knowledge and and architecture and ear training and there's so many things that people don't realize it looks fancy up there of course it looks great and it looks like super exciting but the reality is that's like 10 percent of it you can learn that kind of quick the, the the gesture part right. um however what he was able to get me to do the best for me which is something i always did on the tuba so it was actually quite transferable and i think it helped me out at the beginning was connect to the music like just connect to the music be the music connect with the music i used to think that when i played the tuba how can i be this cool low sound how can i be this this bass line how can i be this cello sometimes bass drum sometimes bass you know string bass sometimes i always am a contra bassoon i'd always try to imitate other sounds and so that was once i got that concept of be the music be what you want to be. Then my studying got better, everything got better. And I started like really started connecting to rehearsals and, and concerts and, and, and people noticed. And it took about a year for me to really absorb that concept. I would say that was probably the biggest lesson I got from him. And also just stay humble, be humble, be hungry um, and don't give up. There was one time about halfway through the first year, I'm like, what am I doing here? And I'm just like, I suck. You know, I'm just terrible. Like, <laughs> I just watched my video. I look like a joke. Look, look at this video. Like, like what am I doing? Like, what? he's like, don't give up. He's like, you just got here. He's like, you're just starting. This is a process. You know, this is probably, you're probably going to study past the two years that you're here with me. And he was right. I wanted to. I just was fortunate to get a job. But um, he was just such a gentle person and someone who just had an answer for everything and a knowledge of, of scores and people. And his stories were so good. I mean, being Bernstein's right-hand man at, and Seiji Ozawa's right-hand man at, at Tangwood for all those years and there the is a sense of humanity, there. right? I mean, that's what I'm, I'm hearing is that, is that, you know, all the technique and all the, you know, and I, I have this book and I've, I've worked through it as much as my simple percussion mind allows me to. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it, he's clearly was a, a brilliant musician and teacher, but there, there was a humanity behind him. And, and, you know, having talked to so many, I mean, is that a fair, like there's just a, a sense of understanding people and, and deeply, the humanity. Yeah. yeah. He cared deeply about everybody. And it's funny. You know, there's there was this whole push about female conductors that started, to my knowledge, it started like five, ten years ago. There's a whole push, obviously now, on on people of color and making sure we're having more equity in that realm, which is. But his students were black. His students were female. His students were from around the world, and I never even, I never even like, 
I, you know, he just treated everybody like, just like, you know, like just so right. simply and equally and beautifully and the humanity he had. And, and I remember Marin Alsop had like a, such a fond affection for him. And I didn't really get it at first. I'm like, obviously they work together, they teach together. Sure. But like sure. she studied with him when she was coming up and he helped her get ready for burns. I mean, it was like, he just had so many people. If you're 40 and above and you're a professional conductor, you probably at some point, I'm talking about 40 up to 80, right? You probably right. at some point went through Gustav Meyer in some way, shape or fashion, whether it was a master sure, class sure. or Peabody or Tanglewood. He just had such an impact on the, on the industry and, and so many wonderful conductors. It's great. Yeah. Well, and that and, and that that idea of a teacher, and he in Maya, yeah, which which he, 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 we shouldn't sort of gloss over, it. right? Well, well, and 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 we all have those stories of people we worked with. I shouldn't say we all have those stories, but I think you know a lot of us that have that have those stories of of the teacher who was you know always at your side no matter what, and then perhaps not in other cases with other other folks that that we, we work with, and that's that's sort of normal in terms of how you connect with folks. But, um, you know, and hearing what you've, you've said and, and others that, that work with him, it reminds me a little bit, you know, my, my teacher just, just passed away, Alan Abel of COVID of all things. I mean, Alan was 90, 91 or 90, 91. Um, and, Sorry. you know, it, COVID and, and this was in April. It feels like it was about a year ago, but it was just, you know, it was just in, it was just in April. And, you know, all of us talking about, you know, his, his teaching and, and it comes back to that same thing. I mean, yes, he saw everybody and he, he taught all these different people and all these players and orchestras and university professors and all that, but there was like this humanity, there was this human being underneath all of that, that came through in every interaction you had with him. And it sounds very, very similar to what you're talking about. So I, I know we could talk about our, our teachers and our influences for hours. And I, I, I would love to do that at some point, but I want to well, make sure we get to, yeah. Go ahead. I think what's important to just to kind of put a bow on this part of the conversation is Please, that yeah. when you have someone who cares about you in that humanistic kind of way, that's the kind of teacher you want to be around. Someone who's like authentically giving you the information, the the humanity to do your best and supports you and wants you to do your best and not be like anyone else but other than you. Those are the teachers you want to be around. It's funny. I didn't have that on the tuba. I kind of did, but not in like a schooling kind of way. I had mm -hmm. Sam Palafian who passed away actually this last year as well. He that. was one yeah. of the first sort of big name teachers who like supported me in a really unique way. And at the end it was Daniel Parentoni at IU who I studied with for about a year off and on who had a real humanity for his students. And you think about it, their students do so well. They get jobs everywhere. Yeah. And the yeah, I wonder why, really, right? Like you, you wonder why that is. You build someone's confidence up and they're gonna, you know, you gotta be tough. It's tough, you know, you gotta be like hard, make sure they're excellent and and but it's well, so in a lot of teaching, important to have the best teacher. It, it is, and a lot of it is so. You know, I think about in my own, and and I'm very lucky that, like, regardless of any, and I, you know, I, I've had very positive experiences with everyone who I've studied with in terms of percussion. But you know, there are times that I'm sure I wasn't the best student, and you know, whatever it is. Right. So, so you know, you think about like, oftentimes the way that I teach is informed not by a good experience I had with a teacher, but maybe a not so good experience. You know, if I remember something that I didn't get from somebody, I try to give that times 10 to my students, whatever that thing is. Um, and so it, oftentimes I, I, I find that I'm informed as much by what I didn't get, um, whatever that is, than as by what I did get, you know? So um, anyway, uh, so you're working with, Gustav Meyer and, and you finish and you continue your career. And I'm just going to, going to do the, you know, bad movie trick here where I'm going to say, so skip ahead a few years, right? So like you, you're traveling, you're conducting, your, your career is growing as a guest conductor. And then you, know, you sort of land your first full-time music director position. If I, if I understand the story correctly, it's in Amarillo, right? I mean, that's sort of mm -hmm. where your first job was. So it is, is, and I hate to keep saying this because I, I'm enjoying this discussion, but as quickly as you can, because I know we've got other stuff we want to, we want to get to. Um, what was that like, kind of landing the first gig, and what did that do for your confidence? And then, and then the flip side of that is always, you know, once you have your first job, there's all the things you realize you don't, you didn't know, and you don't know what you don't know, right? So you're like, oh, I'm totally prepared for this job, and then, oh my gosh, you know, there's there's this whole other world of things that I'm not aware of, so. Take yeah. any of that wherever you want to go. Yeah, I think the some of the things that are really important for a conductor to be 
strong with and good at. I, I naturally had a tendency to be good at those things. I had to develop them and get better at them. Uh, you know, fundraising was always something that uh, I felt very comfortable to be in. Um, programming was something I felt like I, I could always create something kind of unique and fun and interesting. And, you know, I always bounce ideas off you. But honestly, being a music director is literally maybe 20% standing on that podium. The rest is so much more work that, that you just goes on behind the scenes to make sure the organization is not only serving its mission, but serving its mission in a way that's like doing all the things they're supposed to be doing in terms of subscriptions and ticket sales and uh, programming and, and musician, ha you know, audience participation and people being happy and just people being satisfied. You know, no one wants to go to a concert they don't like, you know, like I, I, I and I thought I had all the answers and I was wrong. So learning to be <laughs> learning to be collaborative in a programming sense, learning to be collaborative in the conducting sense. And look, Ember is a it's a regional orchestra. It's a wonderful orchestra. I'll put our orchestra up against any regional orchestra, our budget size anywhere. We're performing at such high levels now after my seven seasons there. It is so exciting, so fun. And, you know, I've got stuff on YouTube that I, people hear and they're like, wow, Amarillo, I didn't know they could sound like that. I mean, I feel very proud of where we come artistically. However, I was also at the same time getting to start conducting orchestras like the National Symphony and Atlanta Symphony and Houston and others, which was a, you know, it was a different, different level. So, I would say that because I had this career that was going in one direction on the guest conducting side and then also got my first music director side job at, a, at an orchestra at a lower level, I was able to build two skill sets. One is how to make an orchestra that can has a higher ceiling of growth to, to grow into, how to raise that level, and also how to take the experience and the knowledge and the feeling of conducting a world-class orchestra to Amarillo. So I, it was nice. I got both kind of going on and, and, and both – informed each other and helped each other and there's the famous saying that uh i think uh eschenbach asked uh Karyon, like how to become a great conductor and Karyon said well take a bad orchestra and make them good not that emerald's bad in any way they just you right. know, they just said take a bad orchestra and make it good cleveland's uh cleveland uh george zell told levine i think in a story that how do you he asked them how do you become a great conductor he said conduct great orchestras <laughs> so it's like <laughs> there's merit to both there's right merit to right, both. right and so I got really lucky in that aspect, and I think the job at, in, in Amarillo taught me a lot of things that I would not have been able to learn as just a guest conductor, and it was a safe environment, small town, great right. people, a lot of support for the organization. I would have I would have had to really, really mess up bad for a long, consistent amount of time for them to get like to the point. Right. So I was able to make mistakes. I was able to say- But that's important, right? Like, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you, but that's, that's like super important, I think, for every musician. Gotta grow. For students that are watching this, and or that will will watch it going forward, like it's a, it's you you have to have that incubator gig. You know, you have to have that. You know, a lot, you don't have to, but it, it, it's helpful to have that. Yeah. You know, chance to learn and figure out and grow, and it's as you said, a very yeah. safe environment because. Yeah. You know, I, I can think of a lot of people who get their you know, especially audition based you know orchestra auditions, right? And you get someone really young maybe coming right out of grad school or, or even, you know, with experiences in new world or other great programs and they get into their orchestra and they struggle for a little while and typically not with the playing, but with all the other things, so sometimes with the playing, but with all the other things, because they didn't, they're kind of going right from school to, you know, the big leagues and, and, and to have that chance to figure it out sets you up for future success in, in, a, in a really specific way and useful. Yeah. Way hundred percent. And, you know, we got to get out of this perfectionist mentality that's right. kind of drilled into you as a, as a, as an up and coming classical musician, like everything has to be perfect and every expert has to be perfect. And that's a, no, that like kills creativity. And I think it took me some years to like, let that part of me die and create a whole other thing that like goes for creativity, excitement, and building up something in a community that's really unique and special rather than trying to be just a legacy conductor supporting the legacy of these amazing composers and masterpieces, but only doing that. And um, this perfectionist mentality that is drilled into us when we're young as classical musicians, I don't think is necessarily helpful for us to be our most authentic creative selves down the line. So Amarello's teaching you the the mechanics of being a music director, right? And then so so you you decide you haven't taken enough, you know, chances in your career, right? You've you've <laughs> so now you're gonna go ahead and start an orchestra because yeah. you know, we all know the lucrative, you know, financially, you know, just just flush with cash. It's like a it's like a Silicon Valley startup, right? You know, starting right. an orchestra from scratch. 
Um, so you, you and uh, a friend of yours, I, and I'll let you talk about Sam because you know him better than I do, but you guys got together and decided to start an orchestra in Miami. Uh, you're from there, if I remember correctly. You grew up in Miami. Yep. You spent a lot of your life there. It's where you are now, uh, I think. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so, so I know you've told this story a million times, and and I'm actually interested in hearing you tell it sort of from the perspective of the how much I don't know. Courage is probably the best word I could use in public. Does it take for you guys to decide that you're gonna, you know, start yeah. an orchestra and then make it yeah. this thing that is now super successful. Yeah, it's been a journey. Um, I would say that I was very lucky and blessed to have someone like Sam Hyken. We met in Singapore. We both joined the orchestra at the same time. We both had a very no, like-minded, yeah, we both had a very like-minded idea of, of, of what kind of not only music we liked, both in the classical music world and non-classical music world, but also we had a like-minded thought of what is the orchestra going to look like in the future this was coming in around like 2005 four to seven eight is when we were in singapore together and the, the economic crisis was just building in the states um you know the 2008 crisis that hit orchestras were hit everyone was like well, what's the orchestra going to look like so we believed that we wanted to do something we tried a couple different things honestly before we found like the whole concept of the new deck, we had different names, we'd have different things. I actually had an opportunity to recreate the concert I did in Singapore at the Adrian Arch Center for the Performing Arts when it used to be called mm -hmm. the Carnival Center. Carnival Center, um, Miami. But, yeah, and I had this like opportunity to do a concert there, but then it fell through at the last second because they ran out of money or something, it was like a whole thing. So like we had been talking, he and I, about a lot of different things. Now, he left the Singapore Symphony one year before I did the Join the New World Symphony because he, you know, he and Michael Tyson Thomas uh, met each other in Verbia and he loved him as an artist and conductor and wanted to work with him in Miami and felt like, okay, now it's time to get back on the, the track to get a job in the U.S. Well, what he found when he got to Miami was that he was really interested in the production side of things, which what was what I was doing in Singapore, doing all this production stuff, like running a chamber series, putting on concerts, raising money for it. That kind of affected him too. And he was doing the same thing in Miami that I was doing in Singapore. So he ended up going to the University of Miami after his New World uh, three-year stint to do production writing and, and, and arranging and, and pop comp and all this stuff just to just build his skill set because he was realizing like getting a job in an orchestra while he was getting closer in auditions the orchestra model was like who knows if it's going to be around you know and instead of sitting there feeling all entitled well i should be making this because my instrument is five hundred thousand dollars and i went to eight years of school and you know let, let me create the kind of life i want to create so he and i had that same ilk we were both you know brass players we we're both go get them you know we we just so many of our personality traits really meshed and we always were doing projects together i would help him in concerts in miami he would help me put stuff together and arrange stuff for me and when I went back to school, it was just like a whole thing. So finally we were like, all right, let's get this together. Let's apply for some grants. And we were striking out left and right, striking out left and right. And then one day uh, we decided, you know what, no matter what happens after, because we had tried after a couple of years, we want to start something here in Miami. One, my mom's dream was for me to come back home and do something in Miami for Miami, for the people here. Two, he loved Miami, loved the scene, wanted to stay here with his wife and, and make a life here. So we decided to, at first, start like a new music ensemble because one we felt like similarly to la miami had this new contemporary art scene like that was just blowing mm -hmm. up uh perez art museum had opened up moma was opening up uh ica like just it was like huge and 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 there was this like you know art basil it was like so many things were happening in the city that were related to contemporary things contemporary art contemporary music and there was no contemporary ensemble. And we just said to ourselves, if we don't do this soon, someone else is going to do it. Right. You know, however, we knew that if we put, you know, John Cage, Zanakis, Boulez and all these modern composers to do a new music concert, it's not going to chisel out the space in Miami that we knew we wanted to try to get a hold of. We didn't just want to be a new music ensemble. We wanted to be an ensemble that played new music, but a wider range of that. So as we developed the concept of the ensemble, uh, there was a couple things we did right right away. One is we had some great advice on get all your paperwork done, get your 501c3 done, get your state applications in, get everything just done. Two, we put up a fake website, fake Facebook page, <laughs> we took a bunch of pictures. You know, we, we got some musicians together and made a recording. 
and we wanted to have everything ready to go so that we could like flip a switch one day and all of a sudden new deco ensemble exists uh we had musicians come over to the house we explained the whole thing we asked them for one day of their life we said please just give us one day to make a recording and then you know let's see how it goes um and then we applied for a grant from the knight foundation a couple years and nothing hit and finally we said you know what whether we get a knight foundation grant or not we're still going to do this and lo and behold as we started the process of putting it together we ended up getting the grant which wow. was for seventy five thousand dollar matching grant over two years so that gave us a little bit of cash that we could play with and we put on our first concert and the reason we put on the first concert uh, where we did was at the Lightbox. It was a small, intimate venue. We wanted to do a right. small, intimate concert, but we were like, how are we going to get people in the door? Like, ugh, you know, what are we, we can't just put all these new composers and talk about them. Like, yeah. So we put together this committee of like how to market, how to get people in the door. Uh, and then Sam and I just always loved the music of Daft Punk. We're like, what would Daft Punk sound like with the orchestra? Wouldn't that be cool if like we arranged it for the orchestra? Like, we just love the art. And, I always felt Daft Punk's music was actually quite cinematic. If you strip away the the beats and you strip away some of the like extracurricular sounds, I always felt like there's something to Daft Punk that's very linear and very, you know, beautiful harmonies. And so we put together some Daft Punk music and we we put like you know living composers like Adam Schoenberg and Paul Dooley mixed in with. Uh, uh, we had a guest artist uh, come in um, and sing with us. Uh, uh, Afro Beta, which was a local Miami group that used electronics and thin synthesizers, but also like, you know, was a singer and just really cool stuff. And then we did Daft Punk. People lost their minds. They were like, what is this? What is an orchestra right. doing Daft Punk? Afro Beta is this like cool kind of underground electronic hip group with an orchestra. That's crazy. All these living composers didn't even know who these people were, but they were incredible. And, um, you know, we kind of stumbled onto a formula that people felt very attracted to. So mixing new music with new music by popular artists, combining it in the orchestral context and delivering it in a very intimate way really grabbed people here in Miami because everyone is searching for something intimate. Everyone's searching for an experience that's really palpable and visceral. The Cleveland Orchestra was coming down here. There's a lot of people who support the Cleveland Orchestra at the time when they were coming. They don't come anymore. But, um, you know, those people would enjoy something like this, we thought. So why not put on a concert where they can get closer to the orchestra instead of being at the arch where it's super far away? Uh, and then with the contemporary art scene, it just it was like this perfect mix of new, uh, new music, cool collaborative guest artists, and these musical suites that really put the orchestra on its head in terms of what it could do. So basically, the tagline we were using was, we're a genre-bending orchestra, we can, meaning we could play styles, all different genres of all kinds of music. However, the orchestra is the greatest vehicle for musical expression because there's no ceilings, there's no boundaries, there's no limits, there's no walls. All the instruments that are available to us here in the 21st century, not only strings, winds, brass, percussion, but synthesizers, roads, moogs, electronic instruments, guitars, electric bass, drum sets, world drums, all of that. Could you imagine if like Mozart or Beethoven had that in their place? You have to think they'd use them, right? I mean they would use what was available to them, right? I mean, they, so of yeah, course, so right. I studied with, I studied with Kurt Mazur and um, in Germany and, and spent, you know, a couple of months with him over there. And I got to go to the Beethoven house in Bonn. Wow. And one of the things that was there was Beethoven's, one of his earlier pianos, which literally had a pedal for a drum, a kick drum and a cymbal. So it could do the Turkish <laughs> march. So right. Of course. And like, that's like, I was like, that is some innovative stuff that would be laughed at today. But that right. was Beethoven's piano for like 20 years of his, of his mid period. Right. So, so you got to think they would use it. Yeah. 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 Of course. They, they, if Mozart was alive today, which I think he is, and, and his name is Jacob Collier, if Mozart was alive today, <laughs> like, you Jacob. know, he. Yeah, he'd be he'd be writing music that uses all these instruments. And at least in, that was the theory in, uh, for our part. So. Combining all these instruments, combining everything together in this new and kind of creative way, we were able to do music that I don't think a lot of orchestras could do because it's hard to be in a groove with an orchestra. That's not how an orchestra typically works. However, when the orchestra does groove, it's amazing. So well, and I've got to think now, sorry, but I, I have to think now as, as you know, we all sit around, I mean, taking away this current moment where we literally are all sitting around, but you know, up until this season, um, I would imagine that what you guys were doing, what you what you are doing, has been attracting some attention outside of Miami at this point, right? I mean, yes. you've been around for ten years, and I th right at least. Uh, oh, about I, ten I just finished our fifth 
It was like oh. a truncated fifth season. Sorry, I didn't mean to add all those extra years. So in just even a shorter amount of time, I was I was yeah. impressed by. But in an even shorter amount of time, um, I would imagine you've attracted some attention outside of Miami. So I don't know how much you want to talk a little bit about yeah. that or share some of those things and some of the artists Absolutely. that you've had more recently. Yeah. Of course, of course. And I think we, so it started out with Afro Beta, then it like grew in our first year, like our first full season, we started to work with some uh, uh, artists that were outside of Miami. And what we found was that a lot of really good artists, like pop artists, like the Kishibashis, Bilal, Emily King, these were some of our first guest artists, Project Trio, of course, they were writing music in a way that would be elevated by the orchestra. All they needed was someone to tell them and show them how it could be elevated. And then the collaboration became like really magical. And so a lot of artists, even like Common, you see they, they work with orchestras because they know there's like a magical element where their music gets elevated by the presence of these colors and this transparency and this beauty that an orchestra can provide. So we had that in our back pocket and we did it at a high level. So we felt good about that. Um, but what we did that was kind of smart in the beginning is we recorded everything audio wise at the highest levels we possibly could and video wise. Now, anything from our first two seasons, I don't think we would put out professionally because we were still forming our sound and who we were. But basically anything from third season on has been super high level and we captured it all. And so we were able to pivot really fast when all this COVID stuff happened and start releasing a lot of this digital content online so that we could like get more sort of known out in the digital sphere and we had our album first come out our first album came out last october uh our videos are starting to get more and more traction i mean our daft punk 2 video which we just put on youtube with no advertising nothing it's already like <laughs> forty thousand views in like two wow. or three weeks our pj morton video that we did last december um uh, between twitter Instagram and Facebook has something like over half a million impressions. I think it's like 650,000 impressions, wow. which basically means 650,000 people watched it for at least five seconds. So it's like, that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah, yeah. really, that's I mean, we, really we, big we reach. Yeah. Took this, we definitely made an effort to, to get the, a digital strategy going, but it's because we had this content we knew it was successful here in Miami. We were busting at the seams here. We knew it. We knew like we were busting at the seams, the light box. We had an invitation to join the, um, be an arts partner with the Adrian Arts Center for the Performing Arts. We had an invitation to do concerts at the North Beach Band Show, the New World Center. And uh, we started getting grants to play in different places. And we found that like, if we play in a lot of different areas of Miami, we can hit a lot of different segments of Miami. But every place we went, people loved it for their own reason and why. And our audience was just going with us everywhere we were going. And we were like, well, it's been four years here and we know we're doing it right. We, we've grown our audience base from 200 to 300 to 500 to 700 to 800 to 1,000. And we have subscriptions and sponsorships. And, you know, part of the growth was we were smart about how we sold our tickets. We did memberships and chair sponsorships, which got us more money up front, but got everyone more tickets. And, uh, you know, however, in the last year, it's taken off on the digital uh, world because now we're able to have a better reach at a higher quality. And now that's gaining so much more traction and putting us in front of a lot of different kinds of artists. And in fact, our whole season this year was based off artists who had seen our videos and were like, wow, I want to work with you. Like Robert Glasper cool. was like, you work with Jacob Collier and Aaron Parks? I'm going to come work with you. You know, like PJ Morton's like, man, you worked with Bilal? I know these guys are great. You know, so it was very strategic, kind of accidental strategy that allowed us to build up our guest artists and, and do all kinds of really cool creative projects. But it was because we captured everything at the highest levels that we possibly could, both video and audio, and always tried to budget that, that now we're able to pivot in this COVID world and still put out content and stay relevant and engage with our, our fans and our community while also looking at new ways to, to put ourselves out there. I mean, it's orchestra really awesome. 21st century. Oh. That was the joke. That was the No, no. Orchestra yeah. 21st century. That's what we wanted to be. Well, and, it, you know, I, I think it's, it's in there's always something. I mean, I'm learning more about what you're doing. I mean, we've known each other. We've talked about your, your ensemble a lot, but I, I mean, I'm learning a lot about it from just from this discussion. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things I'm hearing over and over again, that you're saying the the through line, one of the through lines is, um, you know, we're all practicing for what we should be doing, even if we don't know it, like everything that you were talking about back from, even from like when we, we were students, like, you know, I, I think about what I'm doing now and I'm going, wow, I have to, I have to talk to patrons and donors and I have to speak in public a lot, often without notes and all of these things. And like, this is something I've always been good at and I had done a lot of all the way through my life. And, and no way was that connected to taking orchestra auditions. 
you know, in no way was that connected to, or any really playing anything. I mean, I don't mean to keep picking on orchestra because I love orchestras and orchestra auditions, but like in no way was that, but yet here I am in at least a pretty big part of my career and also in my teaching career, like standing in front of a room full of people and trying to keep them entertained for, you know, an hour, whether that's, you know, conducting them or, or teaching a class or whatever, that that's not something that I train to do, but it's something that I was training to do. You know, and I'm hearing you talk about your time in Singapore and the creativity of the programming you were doing and all this stuff that you were just like, I want to do this and I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And I'm hearing that over and over again. I'm hearing that in some of the work you did and are continuing to do in Amarillo and then building this orchestra in Miami and other things. Like, I know this is something I believe in and I want to do. So I'm not going to worry about what is it, the tyranny of the how. You know, it's, you know what your why is. And so you're not going to be too stressed out of the tyranny of the how. And I think right. that's a, I, I find that to be really interesting in, in lots of different artists to kind of figure out what that why is, you know, so. Yeah. I think if you're like, for that, yeah. focus on, if you focus on serving and you have a, you want to serve your community and whatever that is, your students could be your community. Your, your, your church could be your community. Your, your, you know, for me, it was Miami. Like if we're serving and we're spending all this effort, time, energy, and money on putting on a product then you better well damn know that it's got to be the best possible product you can put because people know quality. Like they go right. to quality, you know, like people understand, like people go to hear the Cleveland Orchestra on music. They have no idea, but it's a Cleveland Orchestra and they know right. they're going to get like world-class quality. You know, people turn on the Berlin Philharmonic or go to Berlin Philharmonic. I mean, I'm sure they'd love to see a, a famous artist or even if they're in the cl classical music scene somewhat, they know certain pieces, but you're going to get quality. You're going right. to get like something exciting. So, we just kept thinking, put on another concert, another concert, quality, 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 creativity, creativity, creativity. Don't worry if it, it's like, you know, as good as the last one. And, you know, each one just kept getting, you know, more refined and more refined and more refined and more refined. If you're always refining your pitch and you're always refining your why, like, why are we doing this? Well, we want to serve. We want to enrich. We want to educate. We want to connect diverse audiences. We want to connect diverse audi uh, artists in a very unique, juxtaposed way. A lot of orchestras took notice of that. National Symphony took notice of that. Boston Pops took notice of that. They hired me. They hired Sam, Atlanta, Houston. All these orchestras started noticing what we were doing. San Francisco. I'm not saying they're like copying models or anything like that. They just right. saw the creativity of what Sam and I are doing. And they've hired the both of us to do different things with all these different orchestras because people are, are looking for a way to make the orchestra engaging in new ways. Like, But do it in a way that, that doesn't legacy, feel... Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, legacy institutions are great. Like, I support right. them. I want to go see Phil Orchestra play Brahms as much as I possibly can. I, I, I do. But, sure. you know, if you want to be relevant and you want to be engaged and you want to have a community support you, you have to speak to society today and you have to speak to your community in a way that's very, very engaging. And I'm not saying those orchestras don't. They probably do in their own way. However, for us in Miami, we found a, a formula that allowed us to do it in a very engaging and relevant way. Well, and I think people know when they're being talked down to and they know when oh, you're yeah. being gimmicky, right? And so yes. like you could tell, we, oh, we're going, oh, and yeah. I'm not talking about any, but you could tell when like an orchestra is doing something because they think, or any organization, I mean, universities are notorious for this too, you know, sort of, you know, trying to trying to do something that because there, there's, a, there's a moment in time that feels like, well, we have to respond or capture this moment. So we're going to do something and they don't think through what they're doing. And so like, it feels gimmicky and it feels fake and it feels inauthentic. And yeah. I think what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is what you guys are doing in, in, in Miami is, is the opposite of all of that. Right. I mean, it's, it's very authentic, it's real and it reflects the community of that city. I mean, I, I lived in Miami a long time ago. I was a little kid. We moved when I was 10 or 11, but I mean, Miami was diverse in the eighties. I mean, it, it was right. crazy, <laughs> but, you know, now it's like, it's, 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 you know, completely, transformed as a city and so uh, yeah it's you have a, to reflect was, it that had a, exactly it had a that's a hundred percent correct it had there was a cultural renaissance happening here mm -hmm. in the art world and in the music world and all all it was just really there was a big renaissance here from i would say i mean it's still kind of going on of course now it's more residential and and like there's a lot of money coming in from south america because of everything down there but uh uh <clears throat> there was a big cultural shift in like the early 2000s through basil through the pam through all these things that like it was just a big renaissance going on um, here for us. But look, the fact that we're small and we're nimble means we could turn on a dime. 
these big super tanker orchestras, they take four tugboats to push them just a little bit to the left, right? They got to have like <laughs> that's 50 right. meetings with the staff of 40 to get like one thing out the door that's going to be a little different. Now, I think a lot of orchestras are, are, aren't always, I mean, look at the LA's, the San Fran, they're like, they're, they're like really hip to what needs to happen. But, but I'm, and, 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 and I know New York feels well, but like, because we were small and because it was run by two people, we were able to divide and conquer. So we got a lot of stuff done, but we were also able to always check each other about programming. What do you think about that? Nah, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's going, oh, no, I don't think that, oh, uh, you know, we'd get into these battles about what kind of program we should have. And then the program became that much better because we both questioned yeah. each other five times about how we wanted to do it. It was never like one decision made. So we always were like fresh. We always stayed in the moment. And because we were nimble, we didn't have to announce seasons until September. We didn't have to raise certain kind of money until later in the season. We didn't have to make program final decisions on guest artists until later. And that allowed us to really speak to society in the moment at the time. So yeah, it's hard for orchestras to do that, you know, really, really hard. I think we're we're all we're all watching that now. I mean, and we're all dealing with you know not not just the COVID thing, but what's happening in our society and the and the protests and the and the the what we're hearing is is and, and you want to always be careful. I mean, this I, I have something else I want to ask you, and we have as I suspected, we're running out of time, and and there's so much more I'm to, sorry, to talk about. No, no, I mean, it, I'm talking. We can now do too, another one later in the summer if you want. But. That'd be great. Yeah, anytime. Uh, but you know, I think. What you're saying is about being nimble and being responsive to the community is important, regardless of the size of the organization. That we all can, we all have ways that we can respond. As long as the response isn't um, what we saw during the immediate aftermath uh, of of the George George Floyd murder, where there were just a lot of empty statements coming out from organizations about, you know, we're going to do this and that and the other, and then. There was nothing really behind those statements, you know, and so then they were criticized for that. And so, you know, the fact that you can react to this and you could be thoughtful about what you're doing and react quickly as an arts organization is really important. So I'm complimenting you guys in the way that you're, you're handling that, not just what's going on, but like just sort of how you're able to do this. So before we go down any more rabbit holes, there we are on this chat, not just because we're friends, but because you've been with us at Swanee now for a couple summers as a guest conductor. And I want to ask you a little bit about what you enjoy about working with young people and and uh, and mm. giving back in that way we've we've discussed that sort of offline before but um what's that like for you to work with young people i mean when i came into the position at swanee you know i i i, I remember when i called you i was sitting in a parking lot waiting to go have a meal with somebody you know it's like all right i gotta, I gotta you know talk to Giacomo about this and it was a really great conversation that we had about you coming to join us in the summer and um Anyway, I just want to get your sense of, of working with young people and what that's like for you. And um, again, go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, I would say that at this point in time in my career in life, I have done and achieved so many of the things I set out to do. Like my biggest dream from when I was 12 years old was to connect the Boston Pops. And I got to do it last summer. Yeah, and it was yeah, like it was right the after most... School. I enjoyed every split second of that moment. And I worked my whole life from when I was 12 years old, because I was talking about the Boston Boston when I was 12 years old. And to be there conducting that orchestra was something magical, man. I mean, I'm telling you. However, since New Deco really got going, we have been doing concerts in Homestead, Florida for immigrant and migrant communities, which is where I'm from, which is where my mom would give a lot of her attention to. She taught at vocational schools for Haitians, teach them how to, you know, get their paperwork done so she they could <clears throat> so they could like, you know, apply for a driver's license and their citizenships and all that kind of stuff. She taught, you know, migrant workers who spoke all these like wild, like indigenous languages, enough English and Spanish. She actually had to teach them Spanish so they can get along and get stuff done in Miami and and she would learn language. So she was very about giving back to that particular community. So we decided as an organization that our first concerts were gonna be in the educational realm would be down in the South. And going down and seeing these kids and these like these audiences that are just all like black and brown and mixed and and, and playing music for these kids, it was like I found my purpose in life. I found my purpose. Wow. I really did. It just was like this. I could do education shows for New Deco the rest of my life because we're giving back to communities that we're never ever gonna have an opportunity to see in orchestra. So that's one aspect of it is giving back to them. The other aspect of it, which is the, the the high school kids, the college kids, is like 
it wasn't that long ago since I was right there. So I know that feeling. I know what you need and I know what you want. You need to be pushed. You need to be loved. But at the same time, you need some realness. And I feel like I was always able to communicate to young people like a realness vibe about like how it is you need to do what you do to achieve what you want to achieve, especially in the classical music world. So there was something on purpose for me about working with kids. And I think when you work with talented kids like Swanee, for example, my goodness, that the inspiration I get back the, the, what, 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 what they feed to my soul, what they feed to me, gives me hope for the future. It gives me excitement about the industry. I'm able to actually give them things that are of value because I've experienced them personally and I'm giving it to them in an authentic way. They are taking it and using it to benefit themselves. It is such a reciprocal feeling that, oh, it's just like amazing. I mean, honestly, like I dream of like starting like a, a, a Swanee type festival, like in Portugal in the islands, you know, like where all these Portugals. You could do it over there. We, we're, we're, we're good here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You can do it somewhere else. Yeah. For sure. For sure. But like no, I, something yeah. about working with that level of, of kids that just provide me with such. And like, honestly, one of the big pivots we did with New Deco is we had just started this organization. Well, we just started a youth orchestra called New Deco Next NXT, which is basically modeled after us, except we started doing mindfulness and meditation and like entrepreneurship and like harmony and improv. And we make them give us melodies and we analyze them like it's more than just you come to the rehearsals and play like we're doing all this like stuff to make them like super well-rounded amazing musicians basically like combining like what a jazz student would get with what a classical musician would get and kind of mixing that up in a way so that they have all these skill sets together which is basically what new deco is right all these styles coming together all these hybrid forms of music so i would say like we pivoted to these like weekly every saturday we get together with these kids and i'm teaching them mindfulness i'm meditating with them i'm a big uh, meditator cool. and a big yoga yeah. practitioner so i we start out every class with meditation sam does pop comp like he'll teach them like harmony he'll teach them theory he'll teach them melody he'll teach them history about uh comp of uh, uh, popular music we dive into new music we just did an educational video you can actually download it on the website that's basically a new music educational video based off all new music, you know? Yeah. And like, to me, it's like, if a kid's gonna learn about music, why not let them learn about new music, you know? So I don't know, like something about working in this range, it's like really filling my soul and filling my heart. And honestly, if I were only to do that, because if I hadn't conducted Boston Pops or these right, right, right. maybe I'd still be like clamoring to get there. But now that I've gotten there and I've seen what the mountaintop looks like and it's really awesome and I love it and I would love to go back, don't get me wrong, I can't wait to hopefully go back to Boston one day. I mean, that's again, that's like the next dream. Right. But the reality is, is like I feel like like I've proven myself that me. It was like more for me in a way. And now it's like and I'm not even like it's not even because I feel like old or something. It's just like I feel like I have this experience that's very relevant to today that I want to pass to these kids. And I'm like itching for it whenever I can. So, um, you know, working with the kids at Swanee and the great thing about Swanee is like these kids are ready to go. It's not like I can do big rep there. We can do concerts of like major repertoire and they chew it up and they can play it, but they don't know it. So I can give it to them and teach it to them in a way so that they really, really know it and can really peel the layers back and they get into it. And then to see them take it and come back to you with that energy, say like, we're on it. We got it. you like, we're all in it together and like create that atmosphere. It's really hard to get in the professional world. You don't always get it. Sometimes I get it, but not always. But with kids, you can kind of make it happen. You can almost psychologically not trick them, but you can psychologically get them to a place where like they know what they're doing means a lot. It's super important. It's really valuable. But they're also learning something they didn't have before, and they walk away better for it. I mean, that's just it's exciting, isn't it? it? Yeah, I mean, it's great, <laughs> yeah. man. It's great. Yeah. It's great. I mean, honestly, if I was conducting a lot of like youth groups more I, I i would be it would be just make me so happy you know like that's it's it's very important to me now like as i move forward in my life that i have that component that aspect of it uh concurrent with all the other stuff that new trust me i want to win grammys i want to go on <laughs> world tours the new deco i want to make recordings but man if i'm not giving back then what's what are we doing what's the here? point you know yeah what, and, and that's and that's such a it's an it's such a it's so great to hear you say that and it's so great to I mean I know from from watching you work for for the last couple of summers and and looking forward to having you back with us in the in the future you know as, as soon as that is a reality right when we could we could do this again 
um, you know, I see the eagerness and, and the joy that you give to the students and I know that it comes back from them. I mean, the feedback we get about you is always incredibly positive and, and that, you know, that from our community, also from our, our patrons and, and they see the passion and the energy behind what you do. And I think that's the other, you know, as, as we, as we begin to wrap this up here, as we look at the through lines of the, the discussion, like, you know, we talked about, you know, you've been practicing for what you were going to do even before you knew that's what you were going to do. And then, you know, there's clearly a passion and there's clearly an energy behind it. everything that you do that that is wanting to lift people up and is wanting to make whatever organization you're working with better when you leave it and and yeah. have that impact. And that's really cool. And that's not something I, I wish I could say that was something that we see in every everybody, but it's it's not. And so to to know that that's something that you do and the sort of the I think the mission of your work uh, for me is really inspiring. And so I just want to tell you that while we're here, you know, wrapping up. Yeah, no, no. And you know, that, that kind of comes back to full circle to the entrepreneurial musician to me, because inherently in classical music, that's not what you're taught. It's all about achieve, 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 top, 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 get to the best, get to the best, get to the best, which is all part of it. It's I'm not disqualifying that, but when you're young and you're in school and you're raring to go and you're ready to get that job, you're not shown the door to, hey, there's another side of this industry where you can make major impact, leave a lasting legacy and bring all of your musical love and passion and dedication and quality to something, but be bigger than just you. And that's the thing that sometimes orchestral musicians sometimes miss is like the music is more important and the serving we do for our community is more important. Sometimes we put ourselves above that. And that's when there's like a disconnect between administration and orchestra and, and musicians and you see fighting and you see unions and blah, 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 all that stuff. If everyone puts serving, because we're all nonprofits, a nonprofit is serves. <laughs> right, if we're all right. serving, we're gonna be happier, like just in our heart and souls. Maybe we don't make $300,000, maybe we make only a hundred, but we're gonna be, giving of ourselves in a way that's making humanity better. And if you can like really adopt that attitude and have an entrepreneurial spirit behind it, I kind of feel like sky's the limit. You, you, you're always going to be wanted. You're always going to be needed. And there's always going to be people who can learn from you. Well, we, we were talking about this before we went on and, and uh, you know, the, what we're, what we're living through right now with this COVID lockdown and, and watching some places uh, succeed and, and others perhaps not succeed as well with, with, with dealing with it. And, and I'm, I'm trying really hard to not be political, although anyone that knows me is fully aware of how I, how I feel. Uh, I, I'm, I'm ready for the cynical John to come out, man. I'm no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, but, but I, but I think that you could see in arts organizations that put the music and the, the performers of that music first. Yeah. That those are the organizations that are that are going to a survive this and b thrive after, and the organizations that that building for, equity exactly for whatever reason don't do that and aren't transparent and aren't open with their communities and with their musicians and with their donors, um, will 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 suffer. And it's this, it, it, there's no we've never dealt with this before, but the principles are still the same thing, right? If you 100%. if you don't put the art in the middle of everything you do, the music, in our, in our case, of course, the music, in the middle of everything and go, what is this, what is serving this? Um, right. Then the rest of it, I mean, all of my normal cynical, cynicalness that can come out, you know, aside, like, that's what matters in what we're doing. And if that's not at the front of it, um, <laughs> you know, COVID, I know. good luck, you know, you know, COVID's not the reason your door, I'm sorry, COVID's not the reason your doors are closed. I mean, it is, right. but it's not the reason that you're suffering. It's, it's. Right. Right. It's because yeah, you're not on mission and you're not serving. Exactly. You're not on mission or your mission isn't coherent. And yeah, you got to take care of your peoples. You know, we, we were not unfortunately able to pay everybody for every concert that was canceled for us, but we did pay everybody half. And the feedback we got from our musicians was like, no orchestra paid us anything because yeah. we're a freelance group, right? So right. they all play different orchestras. And I'm, you know, I'm not just every organization has their own issues to deal with, but we made it a very like we were like, we are going to pay these people something. We don't know what yet. Luckily, we got the PVP and all that good stuff. We were able to take care of what we could take care of. But our musicians come first, our orchestra comes first, our community 
is first. It's all like music community collaboration first. And and when we do that, our donors see it, our musicians see it, our supporters see it, and it all feeds each other so that we can not only survive this time period, but now we've adapted in ways that we're not going to go back in certain ways. We're going to keep of doing course, yeah. some of the things we've we've learned through COVID and as well as get back. So now we're going to be this new entity, this new refreshed organization once we're all come back on stage because we had to adapt and and, and, and do things in, in more dynamic ways. So, Well, that, that loyalty yeah. you're building, I mean, I, I had a bunch of concerts canceled, you know, March, April, May, and June, like everybody else. And, and there was one organization that paid us 25% of what, we were supposed to get paid and it was a freelance mm -hmm. orchestra and then i had other groups that i was hired to work with that weren't freelance orchestras that canceled the contract and again i i am very fortunate at this moment um that both of my full-time positions are still are I, I still have a job i still have two jobs right and so like right. i'm you know we're, we might all be in the same storm but we're not all in the same boat at all and right. so i i right. am in no way complaining about anything but it didn't go unnoticed that like there was one organization that is a freelance group that paid us 25% of what we were supposed to get paid. Right. Um, even if we said, you know, I don't, I don't really need this. I understand. You know, I appreciate it. They're like, nope, you had a, and then other organizations with much larger budgets that just said, sorry guys, you know, you're out. And that impacted me in a way, you know, didn't impact me as severely as it did others. Uh, thank, thank goodness. I'm very lucky in that way. But, um, Anyway, I love to hear what you're saying, and I love to keep talking to you about this and, and I know. Uh, so I many other things. <laughs> we are, I know, right? But uh, I don't want to take advantage of your time, and 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 frankly, I, I want to give us something to look forward to when we hopefully get a chance to do this again. So, uh, yeah. Jacob, I want to maybe, thank you. Maybe, for, yeah, go ahead. Of course, if we ever do, if we do talk again, whether it's this summer or in the future, you know, I would love to talk about how to create something, how to build something from scratch, like get yeah. into the weeds a little bit about like the A to B to C to D, you know, because that could I, be I think we should people do. who have that sort of, because a lot of musicians have that mathematical knack, you know, it's a lot of comparisons, right? Creative, expressive, mathematical, structured. And when you combine those two, you can do a lot of really cool projects and a lot of cool things. It doesn't have to be exactly what we did, but it could be something that's very expressive, but also entrepreneurial. And I'm really, I'm, I really think that those two qualities musicians have in spades that they don't always get to flex those muscles. Well, and I, I'd love to have that discussion with you, and I'd love to, you know, as we're as we're thinking about this, I'm thinking of like all the incredible people that we could put together between who we know and like really have this mm. dynamic discussion about yeah. about the work that's been done. So, so at the risk of inventing all of this while we're still in our current chat, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate you taking the time to come on today. I want to tell you again, sincerely, course, how how popular and how how well received your work has been at Swanning, and and how much I look Thanks, forward man. to having you you and all of us look forward to having you uh, back with us um, Me too. in the future and uh, hope that you're able to keep building, you know, building yourself and your life and your career during this mess here. I know I'm trying to do as much as I can while I can't be a musician, uh, but um, I'm really glad we had this ch chance to chat and I, I know our, our folks have enjoyed it. There's been lots of feedback on the, on the, the chat here. So um, oh, anyway, cool. Giacomo, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. No, thank you, John. Great to be here with you. And, and I want to give a shout out to you. Like, congratulations on all the work you're doing and how you guys are maneuvering through all this. Uh, a huge fan of the festival, Swanee Music Festival. It's been something I've been really just blessed and honored to be a part of. I love it. Uh, you guys are doing great work. Um, and kudos to you for you. You know, you should have your own be interviewed. I mean, your career is just as interesting as any of us because you, you did the big pivot, too, and were able to, like, I mean, it's great, really great. So you're an appreciate inspiration it. and I appreciate you having me. Well, I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. And just to tell everyone, everyone who's watching and everyone who might watch in the next couple of days, our next uh, Swanee at Home program is on Wednesday at one o'clock. Uh, we'll be welcoming Joanne Folletta, uh to talk to, and I'm looking forward to talking to Joanne on Wednesday at one. Uh, she's been a part of the Swanee family for many years now as a guest conductor and very popular uh, person to work with our students. And I'm looking forward to chatting with uh, Joanne on Wednesday. So until then, we'll see everybody uh, later. And Giacomo, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Take care. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. All the best.